Welcome on the show, gentlemen. Uh, Thank you. Son of Peter Pollock, nephew of Graham Pollock, legendary batsman. If I was you, I would have sat at home, relaxed, done nothing, <laughs> not taken the pressure. But you took it on. And uh, must say, you did a great job. Uh, I mean, how did you go through this? It was a motivating influence for me as a youngster, you know, having my uncle still playing, having heard the stories about my dad. Um, and had an influence on your career, you know. At Natal, we played um, under Graham Ford, who obviously helped me, and I had Malcolm Marshall as a massive mentor. But when people say to me, who had the biggest influence on your career, I say, my dad. And they say, why? I said, because he was the convener of selectors who picked, <laughs> picked me to play for South Africa. So it was a bit of a, a family business. Um, I was still staying at home at the time, so I'd always tell him how well I was bowling and how old those other bowlers were looking. <laughs> Um, and when I ended up playing for South Africa in England, against England, um, they called me Daddy's Boy. They had Barmy <laughs> Army had a special song for me for the, for the first series. And they kept, when I went onto the boundary, kept telling me the only reason I was playing is because my dad had, is in charge and he was picking me. But um, Mickey Stewart was also involved in selection. So Alex Stewart was in a similar kind of boat. So it wasn't too bad. But yeah, it was huge. I think that obviously showed me the, the line of, of how to play cricket and, and at home. My dad would always have the advice, so you know it was almost like having a coach 24/7. Uh, Smithy, you also made your debut as captain at 22 years of age, and uh, many of your contemporaries, including Michael Vaughan, writes in his book that this Graham Smith was cocky. He was a little arrogant, and he showed off. And obviously, your <laughs> big build and you know your chewing gum style all helped build that aura. <laughs> I had to build something. Uh, yeah, no, 22. Look back now, it was pretty stupid, um, but. I think in, in many ways it, uh, it initially was like a facade, really, a, a protection mechanism. Well, at least, at least he called you Graham Smith rather than Greg Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it happened, right? What yeah, was it exactly? So, uh, you know, first major tour was to England um, and uh, building up to the Test Series, Nasser Hussain wrote an article, I think it, there was an article where he called me, uh, what's his name? <laughs> uh, and then, uh, you know, obviously in the build-up to, to the test match, you know, there's a lot of nerves, a lot of things being said. And as I was walking out to the toss at Edgebaston on day one, Nasser was standing there with the mascot and he introduced me to the mascot as Greg Smith. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a great start. Very yet. loud and clear. But I was so nervous, I couldn't even get a word out at the time. <laughs> but uh, went on to get a double hundred in the test Two match. So I, I got him back. He resigned after the first test match. <laughs> <laughs> then we went to Lords and he dropped me on nine and I got a double hundred. So... <laughs> I got my payback on yeah. that. So. He learned his lesson yeah. as well. Now, cricketers have a lot of superstitions and the legendary Neil McKenzie story, I believe he did something really bizarre. But as a team, did the South African team ever have any superstition? I don't really think superstitions. I think we all like to do some things our own way. Like you want to put your up, you used to put my left shoe on before my right shoe, left glove before the right. And you'd have your favorite pair of socks and cycling shorts, what you'd want to wear. I think as a team, we always used to look for omens, like when something was going to go in our favor. And, and um, one story I can remember is in, in Pakistan, we had had the first two tests. We drew the first one. The second one was washed out. So it was down to the Dasada and it was in Fazlabad. And um, we got there and they did a bit of a ceremony before the start of the game. And there was something going on where the Pakistan team had done something about the pitch the day before. So we were feeling a little bit like we were being... Um, plotted against and we we're looking for a sign as things were going to go well. Anyway, so they do this ceremony and they've got these young kids holding doves. I don't know actually what they all were, but they're holding them by the wings. And this guy's giving his speech. And as you know, the politicians, when they get the opportunity, they five, 10, 15 minutes, he's talking, talking. And these kids are holding these doves all the time. So anyway, eventually they say, and now the test match is officially open and can begin. So the kids throw these things up into the ground, into the air. But by this stage, their wings are so tired that they just go <laughs> onto the floor. So none of them want to fly. So the kids are now chasing these doves and pigeons around to get them to take off. And there was one white one. And, you know, obviously coming from a Christian sort of background in South Africa, the white dove would be sign as purity and whatever. There was one white one, and that one eventually took off. And it was so tired, it could only have about 10 seconds flight. So it took off, and it came and landed on our balcony on, <laughs> and perched itself right in front of all of us. So we sort of turned to each other and said, this is a good sign that it's come and landed on our thing. Pat Simcox was bowled through the stumps in the match. So the ball went straight through between the stumps. So we had a few lucky things go away and we ended up winning the, um, 
yeah, that was a, a kind of sign. So we did look for signs as to when things were going to go good. Well, I'm missing Simo, you know. Betches always score runs. Paulus always duck wickets. He's very <laughs> excited. Simo. Yeah, sure. What about you? Oh, well, you mentioned Neil McKenzie. I think we, we may as well raise it. You know, he, he had a number of stories over the years of crazy things that he did. He was he's superstitious in life, not only on the cricket field. But uh, I remember playing a test match at Lords, um, and we fielded fairly extensively. And, uh, you know, you had bowling the night, and you've got 10 minutes as an opening batter to get yourself ready. And it's not, Lords is not an easy place to get up to the change room and get back. You've got to dodge all the old, uh, old creatures in, in the long room get up, up the stairs in there. By the time you get there, you've probably got six or seven minutes to do what you need to do to get ready to bat, you know. So uh, I'm busy padding up. I'm, I'm getting ready in a rush, sweating, changing, whatever. And I'm, I'm now ready. I'm busy putting on my helmet. And I look over and Neil McKenzie, who's opening the batting with me, is busy packing his bag up. So he's, he's busy. He's put his pads in his helmet. He's zipping up his, uh, his cricket bag. So I shouted at him. I said, Mac, what are you doing? So <laughs> this is just, he fobs me off and I see him unzip and he starts padding up again. But now this time, the umpires and the England team are already out in the middle. So he's, he's just first putting on his first pad. So uh, we get out in the middle, booze everywhere, whatever. So I, I eventually we into the innings and I, I say, what, what was going on there? And he said, no, when he was padding up, he was sponsored by Gunn and Moore at the time. He touched the O in Moore. So he thought that was a sign that he was going to get naught. So he, he took all his kits off, packed his bag and started again. <laughs> there was one game where he, his teammates messed around with him and they strapped his bat to yeah. the roof. And he ended up getting 100. He, he couldn't find his bat, eventually found it, went out and got 100. So for the next game, he got them to strap it to the roof again. <laughs> that is the funniest story ever. <laughs> yeah. No, he was unbelievable. He was next level. Yeah. <laughs> but... There's one story that A.B. de Villiers told us on this show. <laughs> and he said that he pranked you by becoming a ghost in your room. And you were really scared. And he's scaring bowlers, as we know, around in India at the moment. But apparently, I mean, he told us that you were really rattled. <laughs> <laughs> A.B. was actually quite a prankster. Uh, he, was, he was actually really good at it. Um, but yeah, we played a game in Kanpur. I don't know why we always went to Kanpur. I mean, I, always, I don't know why. I must talk to someone at the BCCR. <laughs> We always went to Kanpur and they had a really old uh, hotel. I remember it being a, a fat, like purple everywhere, and fluffy purple carpets and couches and whatever. And being captain, you know, I always, you know, as a captain, you generally got a suite. You know, you, and it was just the way that it, it was. You know, I think people expected you to have a lot of one on one meetings with, with your players and stuff like that. So in this hotel in Kanpur, um, I had a massive room and there was a whole like lounge and couch section. It was just an enormous room. And I, I, I never actually went into that couch section a lot. So, it, you know, but I, I arrived at training the next day and I said to the boys, no, no, there's something not like, it's not something not good in my room. Uh, it's haunted, definitely. This place is creaking and something, something's not good. So after training, we'll come back. We're all on the same floor. Um, and uh, a couple of the boys come into the room with me, I want to check it out. So I come in, walking around, whatever. And I don't notice they open a window in, the, in this lounge section. So we get on in the afternoon, go for dinner, come back, I'm lying in bed, do some TV, and I hear things moving around in the, <laughs> in, the, in, in the lounge section. I sit there and I go, oh my goodness, what's going on here? So I get up, go open the door, and the room's a mess. The couches have been moved everywhere. Things are lying on the floor. I'm thinking, oh, my word. I'm actually swearing to myself. I'm thinking, what the hell's going on here? So I go, close the door, get back into bed, just think, I'm going to leave it. <laughs> and it happens again. So if he had left, this is where he messed up, actually. If he had left it now, I, would, I wouldn't have slept that night. But they decided to come back again for the third time. And as I heard the noise, I ran. And I saw them climbing through the window. <laughs> so I caught them eventually. Thank goodness, otherwise I would have had a sleepless night. <laughs> it was planned by the Indian bowlers. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Polly? Polly's a nice guy, but I'm sure you've been part of some leg pulling exercise sometime in your yeah. life. Yeah. Otherwise, there was always plenty. When it first started, actually, with the South African side, there was more going on then. Um, you know, just general pranks like they used to get clingy wrap and put it over the toilet so that when you went, woke up the next morning and you went to the toilet, it would like bounce instead of going <laughs> into the toilet bowl and sugar in the beds and, you know, all those kind of stuff and leaning hot water against the door and then when you open it, it falls in and 
wow. it comes on your That's feet. That's some kind of training. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the worst we ever had was Paddy Upton and Hansi had a, a bit of a relationship with regards to trying to get each other and going one up. And on my first trip that we came to the subcontinent was the World Cup in 95, 96. We always used to have malaria tablets. So every two weeks, the doctor would hand out the malaria tablets. We'd have it just in case. And then one morning, Hansi was having a bit of a spat with, with Paddy and trying to get one up on him. And he went to the doctor and said, listen, give me the malaria tablets. I'll hand it out. But what he did is he got two sleeping tablets as well. <laughs> so he handed us all the malaria tablets out. And then when it came to Paddy, he handed him two malaria tablets, which were actually sleeping tablets. <laughs> And about 45 minutes, hour later, we ended up leaving for the ground. And it was quite a bus trip to get to the ground. I think it was like a 45-minute drive. And we were all watching Paddy, and he was sort of starting to, to nod off a little bit. And when we got to the ground, he still hadn't fallen asleep. So um, we, we did a bit of a warm-up, and Paddy was all over the show. He was like, a, like a, a foal that had just been born, you know, couldn't keep his feet together and almost collapsing. But to his credit, he still wouldn't fall asleep. So he said to Bob, come on, we've got to try something. So Bob got the boys together. He said, listen, I'm, I'm detecting a little bit of tension in the camera. You know, I want us to just relax a little bit. I don't want us to get up tight. So all lie on your backs, and we're going to have a bit of a, like a meditating session. And it was two minutes in, and you just heard Paddy. <laughs> <laughs> he, had, he had fallen asleep. So we, we got an umbrella. We put it up, and he ended up sleeping for most of the practice. Um, <laughs> that is so Hansi was the winner. <laughs> Ollie, you know, I have seen a lot of players celebrate after winning a particular match. And what they do is they give high fives and stuff like that. You know, they hug each other. You are one of the only cricketers I have seen who, against Sri Lanka when you won, you celebrated by hugging the umpire. <laughs> <laughs> it actually, it wasn't, uh, we hadn't won at that stage, but I, I got a wicket. And that's why we celebrated. Uh, there was reason behind it. Um, in those days, we used to have issues with the white ball, the decoloring of the white ball. And after 34 overs, they used to change the ball. And it was quite a tight game. It was Adelaide. And um, Biffy was captain at the time. And we were touch and go as to whether it would win the game. I think Chaminda Vass was even at the crease and was going quite well. And when they changed the ball, they came and they gave it to us. It was a regulation. Now, for those who don't know, the ball we play with is a turf. So it's harder. It's got a less pronounced seam, and it sort of carries, when you hit it, it, it obviously goes further. The regulation is, is softer, a lot softer. So it can almost be like a, trying to hit a lemon at times. <laughs> so when they changed the ball, they gave it to me. I used to take notice of the ball. I was shining it up, and I looked, and it's got regulation. And I thought, jeez, bowled a few balls, and they were trying to whack it, and the ball was going absolutely nowhere. <laughs> so eventually, I bowled, I think, a slow ball, a low, low full toss or something to Vass, and he whacked it and got caught on the, on the boundary. And uh, then I, I obviously knew that it was through the fact that the umpires had given us a regulation that I'd got, because it wasn't the greatest delivery. So as I ran past, I gave him a hug. I think to this day, he still doesn't know why I gave him a hug. <laughs> I'll him but I was ecstatic because it meant that we were probably going to win the game and I'd picked up a wicket. Um, so it was, yeah, it was just something that... And when you see the footage, favor. there's Graham Smith coming from, I think, mid-off. And he's like, did he cross? Did he cross? <laughs> yeah, that's how tight the game was, you know. We were worried about... Um, about Losing, but and that, been a tough tour as well. Yeah, so we hadn't won anything many. to win. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, talking about celebrations, I think your biggest celebration was when South Africa chased Australia's 434, if I'm not mistaken, and you won that match. And it was some epic stories around that particular game, especially with Callis. You were there inside the dressing room. Tell us what exactly happened. Yeah, I mean, it was it was two all in the series, uh, going to the Wonders, which is probably you know our best stadium in, in South Africa, most iconic stadium in terms of the atmosphere and the buzz that, of playing at the Wonders. And, you know, I, I, I won the toss that morning and bowled first. So when Australia crossed 400, I felt amazing. I thought of, I patted myself on the back, said, good job, <laughs> a good decision. Um, and, and, you know, first time anyone had crossed 400, 434, I think they got. And, you know, you're walking off and you're thinking, wow, you know, how did this happen and uh, how are we going to do this? So everyone's obviously a bit down. Um, get into the change room. I thought to myself, well, I'm captaining, but I've got to open the batting. So I've only got 15 minutes. Let me get myself ready first, get padded up, get organized, and then we'll try and see how we, how we go about this. So while I was padding up, change room dead quiet. Everyone's sitting in, in their little spaces. No one's saying anything. Callis came up the stairs about 10 minutes after everybody else. 
and said, guys, bowlers, I think we've done a good job. They're 15 runs short. So everyone obviously <laughs> burst out laughing. You know, it broke the ice. Uh, wow. And sort of the change room chilled out a little bit. And, and then we decided to set some targets, which were ridiculous. So we all started laughing again because we'd never seen like, you know, after 10 overs, let's be at 160 or whatever it was, you know. So it was just, it, it, was, it was mental. Um, and it ended up being the most iconic ODI ever played. You know, we chased it down. Um, we could have done with Polly, who was injured for that game. You know, maybe maybe they wouldn't have got to 400 and could have done with his batting at the back end. But uh, yeah, an epic celebration. Uh, actually, a funny story about Mark Boucher. We, we really celebrated uh, that night uh, with the Australian team as well in the hotel. And the hotel had a glass lift, see-through lift, and Mark had had a few too many. He decided to take himself off to bed and we all sitting with the, some of the Australians watched him wobble his way to, to the lift. He got in the lift and he went to push the button and he missed the button, fell over. <laughs> and for the next 45 minutes, we all watched him go up and down and, <laughs> until Brett Lee couldn't take it anymore. He went and fetched him and took him to bed. <laughs> epic, that is. You know, and especially coming from Jack Callis, I've, I've interviewed him so many times and you can't, you know, there's no expression change in one hour. <laughs> like he never says anything and there's, no, no, he's, he's always uh, like, there's the same stoic Jack Callis and yeah, he actually said this is like epic. Yeah, he's, he's actually got a really subtle, subtly you know, sarcastic, good sense of humor, but he's a very quiet man. He doesn't say much. He's very much an introverted guy. Um, so that's why when he does finally have a punchline, it actually makes an impact. <laughs> yeah, huge impact. Yeah. Polly, I'm going to talk about the 1999 World Cup. I don't yeah. know whether you'll appreciate okay, it or not. There. Let's go there. <laughs> You're going to get that a lot now with the World Cup coming in England. <laughs> but you know what? He had a fabulous performance himself. So he, he has some great memories of his not, performance. Not much good. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Indian fans always remind Indian cricketers about the bad days they've had. Yeah. So I'm sure Chetan Sharma today even is still reminded of that last ball six that Javed Miyadad hit him. Yeah. He can have as many good performances for India, but we'll still remember that. And I'm sure you've also got a lot of uh, problems because of that 1999 yeah. World Cup. We never lost the game and it happened a couple of times in the World Cups for us. But uh, it, was, it was a great game of cricket because the ebbs and flows. You know, they had it won, we had it won, we finally had it done and then it, it didn't happen for us. But um, yeah, we'd actually played Australia in 97, 98. We'd toured there and we'd had some good one day results and we had a bit of a team song going at the time so it was tub thumping I get knocked down but I get up again because the tests had gone well but the one day as we were beating New Zealand and beating Australia and, and things were going pretty good and every time we won we would turn that song up and the change was next to it and Steve Ward made a few comments about <laughs> tub thumping. I get knocked down. Yeah and he, he wasn't too happy about that song he's like a reference about that bloody song again or something along those lines and I can tell you that as you talk about the dressing room in, in that 438, when you went in there, it was quiet. Um, when we'd lost and we hadn't got over the line, um, we obviously sit in there and everyone's depressed. And all we hear next door is that, I get knocked down <laughs> <laughs> and I get up again. So that was quite a funny one. And then obviously it was Alan who, who, who'd ended up not running through Fusion the and he had number 10 on his back. And we got home and about two weeks later was the Rothmans July, which is a massive racing event in South Africa, uh, in Durban, which is my hometown. And so we went to the Rothmans July. It's a bit of a gathering. It's a social activity. And one guy came up to me. And you, on those days, everyone's giving you tips about who you should bet on. I mean, I didn't know who, which horse was whatever. You just look at a name and think what number you like and bet on that. So the guy comes up to me and says, hey, what about this main race? Who are you going to bet? Who are you gonna, da, 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 da. So I'm like trying to give him my explanations of what I've heard. But he actually wasn't interested. He just wanted to have his little one-liner at me. So anyway, once he's finished, he says, well, what I think is don't bet on number 10 because he doesn't run. <laughs> I was like, oh, very funny, you know, like, because Alan didn't run in the World Cup. You can go and check the result. 1999, winner of the Rothmans July, number 10. <laughs> <laughs> Al Picho was the one who romped home. So uh, his advice wasn't right. And you have suffered in India all the time because of your brilliant performance against Zahir Khan. So I kind of, it's a cliche, but I'll remind you of that. I, 2006, I was covering the India store to South Africa and I was in the commentary box and the stump microphone was raised a little bit and I could see the entire Indian team sledging at you. Even when Kumle was bowling, they were saying, well, ball Zaheer, come on, <laughs> when, when Grammy was batting. Yeah, so I, I'm consistently reminded of, of Zaheer Khan. <laughs> Actually, on social media, I, can, I think it's about at least once a day an Indian <laughs> will, uh, will tweet me and tell me about Zaheer. How are you against Polly? 
No, I was terrible as well. <laughs> I was terrible. <laughs> so, you, Polly, you got him out like four uh, times in the I, net I, session? I think I'd be, I'd be winning the battle. I think in, in the nets, I was amazing against Polly. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had his number. Well, it's not, not too bad. Not too, well, I was going to say, too good bowlers to, to least talk about. At least it wasn't an average bowler that had the wood over me. <laughs> Polly, you were somebody who irritated Sachin Tendulkar with that, you know, nagging length and he liked to hit it on the rise and you didn't allow him to do that. And that time we didn't like you at all because Sachin irritated means uh, entire nation's mood is affected. So, you know how it is. But when you, you and him played for Mumbai Indians, we said, yeah, same team, not a problem. Yeah, it was actually quite nice. I mean, obviously, when you played against Sachin, um, with his reputation, you always wanted to try and get him out because he was the star performer um, and he was a real threat to winning the game for, for his country. So... He wanted to and we came across each other often because I opened the bowl and he opened the batting in one day and, and then you'd meet him in the test matches. But the first time I actually met him in a test match was quite interesting at the Wankhede Stadium. Um, it was obviously home ground, Mumbai for, for Sachin and I think he'd, by lunchtime or so, or just after tea, he'd got himself close to 100 and everyone was starting to flock in to the stadium. You know, we started off with maybe 2,000 people at the ground. By the time he'd got to 90, it was probably about 10 or 12,000 that had gathered. And then I think it was Hansi or Jacques or someone got him out down the leg side for 90. And we came together, we gave high fives and everything. And there was still two hours to go in the, game, in the day's play. We turned around and everyone was funneling out of the, <laughs> out of the stands. They were all going home. It was like it was a fire um, evacuation. But um, yeah, it was nice then after that, obviously, whenever you, you played against him, obviously the amount of applause and the way the, the crowd reacted to him, to play with him at Mumbai was great because no matter where we went, it was like a home game for us <laughs> because you've got Sachin in the side, that means everyone's going to shout for you and, um, and get behind you. So that was a nice experience and it was nice to get to know him and see him from a different perspective behind the scenes. You also got a lot of standing ovations. Polly, Polly, you were called Polly Kaka also. Yeah, they gave, <laughs> they gave me Polly Kaka. Kaka in South Africa is not such a... <laughs> That's not a good word. That's such a good word. But Actually, here in India, is uh, Kaka means uncle in Marathi. Yes, yes. No, they, oh, they did call me Polly Kaka in... In South Africa, it means rubbish. <laughs> in, in putting it nicely. Yeah. And then, uh, I suppose, in the first year, there was... Sanath was playing for me and they used to shout for him. And by the end of the the tournament. Sachin hadn't played the first seven or eight games and so they started to get behind me and shout Polly for me, so which was quite unusual. You know, when you come to India, you never got anyone shouting for you, just against <laughs> you. But uh, yeah, that was a nice experience. But I say it was all down to the fact that I was playing for Sachin's team. <laughs> but you know, Sachin got standing ovations wherever he went. The Indian team got it. But there was one game I remember in Kolkata where the South African team got a better reception than the Indian cricket team. Tell yeah. us something about that. Yeah, I mean, I, actually, I had many interesting experiences in Calcutta. I mean, once I spent all day in a hospital because a car drove over my foot. Oh, really? But uh, <laughs> this one was uh, quite an amazing. I think it was just timing, really. Uh, you know, Greg Chappell was... Uh, we were very lucky that he was coaching India and causing all the chaos that he was. <laughs> And uh, he decided to drop uh, Ganguly and uh, move him away from the captaincy, which was perfect timing to go to Eden Gardens. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember we bowled India out reasonably cheaply. I think he got session again that day, actually, from, from memory. And uh, I managed to get 100 batting second. Uh, I think it was 130 odd not out. And I remember standing in the middle of Eden Gardens, the old Eden Gardens, so it was 80, 90,000 people. And listening to them cheer for us because they were so upset with what was happening with Indian cricket that sort of Ganguly wasn't playing. Uh, and it was just such a unique experience uh, standing in the middle of Eden Gardens, as Polly says, and listening to all the Indian fans cheer for every run that you get. So I was like, <laughs> it, was a bit, it was a bit out of kilter um, and a bit of memory that I'll certainly keep with me for the rest of life. Actually, I won a motorbike in that, in that series for Man of the Series. I still haven't got it. Can you, can you try and find it for me? Okay. <laughs> this show will probably get you done. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is time for the hammer game and uh, this is time to relieve your frustration. Uh, he had an edge over you uh, when it came to bowling against you. Not this is your time to take revenge because this is about brute strength, <laughs> playing the hammer game. Let's see, see who I'm hits... Polly, you'll have a theory about this as well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's no. see who hits the hardest. Come on. I don't know about that. This is the hammer game. And you can decide who goes first. Age before beauty. <laughs> we, we have to enter the master's division, eh? The master's, we can't enter with the youngsters. So what's the thing? Just swing as hard Just, as you can yeah, and whack absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> Come on, oh! let's 
let's see. Let's see. Is that hurt? Jeez, my wrist. You're really going to snap. <laughs> Sorry, Andre Russell. This is going to be big. Tommy. 180. Come on, come on. Yay! Right, this is like this is a world record, I think. Come on, come on. Yes, yes. Wow, nine one one. Oh, you well are the winner. Well Congratulations, Vinny. <laughs> you're yeah, you you you're, you're right. <laughs> well done. This show is about celebrating the ducks. What the duck? So we are going to check your ability to draw a duck. Mm. Got a few. Might as well draw one. There you are. You can take your positions. Okay. Polly asked for the extra color. Got it. <laughs> well, you got to have red to go with the hair. You know. I mean, this is like. <laughs> there you go. Wow. Polly's like. Have serious. you seen my protea? I've got a protea egg going. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing visualization by Graham Smith. 3D perspective by Sean Pollock. Amazing. <laughs> Signature of the artist, it will be nice. Well done, gentlemen. We have small gifts for you, but it will be like it will be in your memory bank for sure. Okay. We'll start with Graham Smith. This is number 19. These are the total number of ducks you've scored across formats. Really? <laughs> oh, oh, that's oh, about that's <laughs> that's a good one. That's the Keep your shirt. <laughs> 19! Unbelievable! 19 and 31. <laughs> yes! Oh, it's mad much, right? Thank you. <laughs> Batting average of 34, so it's not bad. Okay. Sheesh! <laughs> 31! <laughs> what happens when you play so many games? <laughs>